Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping in my shows and just digging what I'm screaming here, then smash that like button and spread the word to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So for today's show, I'll be reviewing the 2016 La Femme Rouge Terre Rouge. Uh, it's a this wine is from Morocco. I've been super excited to finally review this wine. I bought this wine back in April of 2019 from Psalm Select. Now, according to Ian Cobble, the founder of Psalm Select, if you're blinded by this wine, you could easily put it in the Northern Rhone or at least call it a top quality Syrah. I've never had a wine from Morocco or anywhere else from the African continent other than South Africa. So let's talk about Moroccan wine first. I'll take directly from Wikipedia's uh, history entry. Viticulture in the region of today's Morocco is believed to have been introduced by Phoenician settlers and was definitely established in the era of ancient Rome. Large-scale viticulture was introduced into Morocco by French colonists, just as it was to the neighboring country of Algeria. However, the quantities of Moroccan wine produced was never nearly as high as that of Algerian wine. At the time of the country's independence in 1956, there was 55,000 hectares or 140,000 acres. Although much other French expertise left when Morocco became independent, the wine trade continued to be significant into the 1960s until the EEC or the European Economic Community, the early precursor to the EU, introduced quotas in 1967, which led to significant reductions in the previous export to the EEC countries. Under a combination of restricted access to the traditional market, and competition from overproduction in other Mediterranean countries, much of the wine production became uneconomical and a significant portion of Morocco's vineyards were grubbed up and replaced with other crops. In the period 1973 to 1984, the vast majority of the vineyards were also taken over by the Moroccan state. The state introduced measures such as fixed prices for grapes, irrespective of quality, which were not compatible with regaining competitiveness and generally handled its vineyard very poorly. In the early 1990s, there were 40,000 hectares or 99,000 acres of vineyards in Morocco, of which 13,000 hectares or 32,000 acres were planted with vines for wine production rather than for table grape or raisin production. And of those vineyards, more than half had old or diseased vines of low productivity. In the 1990s, during the rule of Hassan II of Morocco, the Moroccan wine production started to improve due to foreign, primarily French, investment and know-how. This was achieved by offering French wine companies the possibility for long-term lease vineyards from the state agriculture company, SODEA. Several large Bordeaux-based wine companies, including Group Castel, William Peters, or, or Pitters, I guess, and Talion, entered into such partnerships which have been successful in reviving the Moroccan wine industry. As an example, the Castel brand Boulain, Boula, Boulain, I guess, was the best-selling foreign wine in France of 2005. And the vineyard area had expanded to 50,000 hectares or 120,000 acres in the early 2000s. Some smaller investors, more oriented towards higher quality wines than the high volume market, have later followed. Now, red wine is the dominant style of wine. It's over 75% of the production. This is followed by Rosé and Von Gris about, at about 20% total. Rosé and Von Gris are effectively both rosés, but from what I can tell, Von Gris is a lighter rosé. White wine is only around 3%. Now, this is from the 2005 numbers. So there may be some major differences here in 2020, you know, 15 years later. Quite a few red grapes are grown in Morocco. Again, from 2005, Carignan, which was at one time the most dominant grape, then you have Senso at about 40%, then Alicante and Grenache, those are all the most planted. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Syrah have been growing in percentage over the years. Rounded out, the white grapes are Claret Blanc, Muscat, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, and Sauvignon Blanc. Morocco has five regions with 14 appellations called Appellation d'Origine Garantie, or AOG. 
In 2001, there was a single AOC called Coteau de la Tasse Premier Cru. This wine comes from, this wine comes from the Rabat region. Its AOG is Zairon. I'll show you the usual Google Earth video while I quote from Psalm Select. Located in the Zairon wine appellation, about an hour's drive southeast of Rabat, La Femme Rouge, or the Red Far, first began as an agricultural estate in 1908, with the construction of the winery occurring in 1933. Actually, it's the cellar from what I understand, not the winery, so maybe a little bit lost in translation. In the 1990s, the owner began selling grapes to winemaker Jacques Poulain, a boisterous French-turned Moroccan, and after a long-awaited meeting, the two joined forces and formed La Femme Rouge Winery. Over the last two decades, they have undertaken major renovations and initiated a massive shift to sustainable farming in the vineyards. Additionally, when Northern Rhone superstar Alain Graillot started his new Sirocco project in Morocco, he sought out Jacques to help him make the wine. Put simply, Jacques is among the most influential winemakers in the country, and Syrah is his specialty. In the previous episode, I talked about Romain Giberto singing the praises of Arnaud Lambert. I find a parallel here with Alain or Alain, Alain consulting with Jacques on his Sirocco wine. A kind of different dynamic though, but a person with the reputation like Alain basically singing praises of a winemaker not as well known. To add to that, I also have a bottle of that Sirocco. I'm super excited to try that one now, and I might have to make that my first episode of 2021. All right, so today, La Femme Rouge employs more than 400 locals. While an impressive number, the figure was lost on us, this is still Psalm Select here, until we reached the literal pinnacle of our tour. We scaled some stairs and tiptoed along metal catwalks, he says Osha would have a field day, stopping to absorb the breathtaking sunset. Then Jacques turned around up, turned us around to face the village and extolled to the world the beauty of Femme Rouge. Hundreds of houses came into view, many of them painted a deep scarlet. And quote, before we, before we come, nothing, Jacques said. Now the houses painted red are lived in by those who work here. We were floored. The, they single-handedly breathed life into a village uh, by way of wine. The winery currently owns some 900 hectares or 2,200 acres of land. While some are uncultivated, most are planted to an array of crops with a massive portion dedicated to olive trees and, of course, wine grapes. Miraculously, they do all this with a trace of herbicide. Jacques doesn't believe in it. He wants his wines to reflect both the maritime climate and rich soils, which range from sand to shale to clay limestone. Depending on the vintage, Terre Rouge is predominantly Syrah from 40-year-old vines with small amounts of Tempranillo. Today's 2016 is nearly 100% Syrah, entirely hand-farmed and made at the winery. It goes, undergoes a traditional fermentation in concrete tanks and ages in used burgundy barrels before bottling. All right, so that was, that was all Psalm Select pretty much, except for a few comments here. All right, so let's get into the stats on the wine. The 2016 La Femme Rouge Terre Rouge Syrah, $24 from Psalm Select. It's a Syrah blend, and I have no other info, info on this, but I'm assuming there's a little bit of Tempranillo in it. The soil is sand, clay limestone, and shale. The farming is sustainable. The alcohol is 14% ABV. It's aged in neutral burgundy barrels. So let's get into the wine. So you saw the little Google Earth video, and I had a lot of fun doing a little bit of research on the Moroccan wine areas. There was a little bit of um, confusion looking at a different couple, a couple different maps that I could find. It looked like some things were labeled really weird, but I think everything was labeled the same. It's just how it looked. But uh, I am super excited to try this wine. And now that I know there's a little bit of connection between this and that Sirocco wine and the... Um, the skill of these people, or at least we're assuming the skill of these people. I'm just super excited to do both lines, but let's do this one first. Super clean. So I got this really bright red fruit, like strawberry, raspberry, bright blackberry, blueberry, some uh, tobacco cedar box, 
fresh tilled earth. This kind of, um, well, yeah, just again, the cedar box. Spice component, some white pepper, black pepper, cardamom, a little cocoa, a little French vanilla. But that's all kind of slight. I mean, it's it's there's a little bit of that oak spices, but it's not a whole lot. But it's really bright and fresh smelling. You know, ripe fruit, fruits ripe and all that. Let's uh, have a taste. So that quality of fruit continues for the most part. It's only got that ripeness, but there's also a bit of grip to it. A little bit of um, like you're getting like the like the blackberry. You know, blackberry can kind of have that bitterness because of the, the the skins of the little individual berries. Blackberry can have that little bit bitter bitterness. It's got that in there. It's got that um, raspberry, black raspberry, blueberry, but it's also like. All the fruit's ripe, but you but it's like you're you're literally tasting the skins with it. So you've got that touch of bitterness, that touch of grip to it. Um, the tannin is starting to build up a bit. I also get a little bit of like leafiness, a little bit of bramble, a little bit of like a twig type of thing. So twig and berries, right? It's a drink. fresh tobacco, cedar box. So this is really a fruit-driven wine. It's ripe for sure. It's not overripe and jammy. It's not like Australian Shiraz or anything like that. But you really taste the, it's like really like I just had a fruit cup of red and black and blue fruits, right? And it's like just so fresh and, and just, just about the right, the correct ripeness to it. And then you have the secondaries. So you have like that tobacco, you have that cedar box, you have that, that stemminess, that, you know, twig. Um, you've got a little bit of leafiness to it. You have a uh, earthy component. So, but like when I got the white and black pepper on the nose, I don't really get that on, on the, on the palate. There's something I am getting on the palate though. It like just showed up right as I was smelling. So maybe it's more the aroma than the actual palate, but it felt like it was the palate. I mean, maybe because I'm looking for the, the for the pepper now, I kind of get that white and black pepper. There is a bit of herbaceousness to it, like an oregano type of thing. Yeah, like an oregano type of thing. A little green tea, cardamom, bitter dark chocolate. The tannin is still building. Um, it's it's both on my tongue and on, on the gums, so it's really coating the mouth really well. The alcohol is well integrated, you know, 14%, right? 14% alcohol. It's not over the top hot, but but you know it's there. There's a good complexity to it. It's a good length, good finish. It's a really well-made wine. It's also why I think you really need to have food with. Like I could I could drink this on my own, on its own, but I really need to have food with this wine. The acidity is actually pretty high too. Well, that's pretty amazing, actually. I don't know the exact climate of Morocco. I don't know if because it's, uh, I mean, it's a maritime climate. So, but as far as like how hot it gets, but I would imagine that the ocean helps moderate the climate a bit. It's not like it's on the ocean, but it's close enough to the ocean that it probably moderates the, the climate even during the summer. But it is near the equator. So, or like almost literally at the equator. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to get hot there.
I can see having this with barbecue, pizza, burgers, a good juicy steak. It doesn't have to be like over the top on the steak, but yeah, you could go, you could go a little over the top of the steak if you wanted to. Absolutely, you know, uh, pot roast, stews. It goes with just a variety of stuff. Stuff that's rich and heavy, or at least complex and, and bold, because this wine is a, it's a, it's a pretty big boy. I'm excited to try this other Syrah from Morocco. If you can find this wine somewhere, uh, especially as it being in the mid-20s, at least Tom Selects price, and so it's probably about right. Even though I bought this almost a year and a half ago, I'm sure it's not more than 30 bucks. And it's not, it's not really going to have any tariffs since it's Morocco rather than France, like last, like the last episode. So yeah, um, it's a good wine. If you can find it, and it's gonna be hard to find this wine. Uh, if you can find it, I definitely would suggest uh, getting it. On the back, it says AOC uh, Zaron uh, instead of AOG. So the book of knowledge might be a little bit incorrect as to what they call stuff. But anyway, it's, it's, it's appellated. All right. So that's uh, today's show. So again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button to subscribe and then tell your friends. And until next time, we'll see you later.